you to have stayed in, but we are encouraged by your presence. We're going to talk tonight about the tongue, the tongue. Appreciate uh, Brother Francis's choice of songs there on the angry words, because, um, boy, how quickly uh, you can say things or do things and, uh, you know, things that you regret. And so I forgot my Bible. Might need that. You know what? I also might want to turn my phone off. I was using it during singing, and so probably wouldn't be a good idea to get a call. If I got a call, you can just about guarantee it would be for an extended warranty on a car. Y'all get those? Oh, my word. I guess they think if they just call a billion times, they'll get a million hits or something. But uh, maybe we ought to do that with the gospel. Just uh, keep calling that way. Can you imagine people saying, well, you know, I, I would answer that, but I'm sure it's one of those church members of the church wanting me to obey the gospel. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great thing? You know, that people uh, people would know that. But uh, appreciate uh, trying to lose my voice, so if I do halfway through, we'll just stop. But uh, appreciate our young people. I, I tell you, I was sitting... Uh, She's not here. I can tell you, Madison stole my seat this morning in Sunday school. And so I had to move. So I was lost. I was on the total other side of the table. But I was sitting beside Megan, who just, I didn't realize what a pretty voice she had. And uh, really glad that she was there. She had so many of the high parts she can hit. But tonight, Callie was sitting behind me. And um, on the next to last song, I had no idea where the chorus was going. It was just, you know, the tune. And, buddy, she just piped in back there, and I was, like, able to follow her, you know. So we're, we're blessed, and these kids that sing out, I'm so thankful for that because, uh, well, you know, you need it. We've got to have folks that will sing out. Watch our tongues. I love, you know, that's something we sing with. And what the whole reason that we sing is to teach and admonish and encourage uh, one another. You know, that's the thing that uh, the instrument can't do. The instrument can't teach us how to obey the gospel, how to be faithful. But, you know, words can give me the Bible. You know, I mean, what's that talking about? Jesus loves me. You know, that's, that's teaching me that Jesus loves me. So our words can be very powerful tools. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, in, in verses 1 through 7, he gives no less than 14 different things where he, he's, you know, this and that. He's comparing the two, a time to live, a time to die. And he goes all through that. And notice in verse 7, he says, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. There is a time when I need to say something. Um, you know, a lot of times people think, well, it's just best to be quiet. Well, sometimes that's not wrong. Sometimes it's wrong to be silent. You know, uh, wasn't it uh, Brother Claiborne had the book out, you know, When Silence is Wrong? Wasn't that the name of it? I think he has volume one and two. It was something along those lines. In other words, when you don't say anything, sometimes you can be in great error when something needs to be said. Notice with me, if you will, James 1.26. I've always thought this is the, the concise passage. Now, James chapter 3, well, you, if you're over there, you just want to go ahead and mark James chapter 3 because we'll definitely be hitting that. But in verse 26, it says, If any man among you seem to be religious, but he can't control his tongue, he can't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In other words, it's empty, it's worthless, he might as well not be practicing it. I always thought that was a, you know, the idea of what Jesus says, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. In other words, it would be better if you didn't even do it. You're just really wasting your time, uh, the vanity. So a man that can't control his tongue, the Bible tells us that uh, his religion is vain. In Proverbs 15, in fact, that whole section there, in Proverbs, we'll look at verse 1 here in a moment, but it says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Think about that. Everything around it benefits from it. Uh, the New American Standard Bible says a soothing tongue. King James, of course, a wholesome tongue. Uh, NASB, a soothing tongue. The ESV will call it a gentle tongue. And I appreciate that because uh, in verse 1 of that same chapter it says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Uh, we're going to be studying this <laughs> uh, next quarter, as a matter of fact. But uh, one of the greatest examples, I believe, in all of the Bible of a soft answer being given when maybe that's not what you want to do is in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 8. 
the men of Ephraim are ticked off because Gideon, who doesn't want the job that he has, remember that? Gideon didn't want it. He asked the angel, why are you here? You know, my house is nothing. I'm not cut out for this kind of work. And then when God says, I want you to go and do this, he says, well, can you give me some proof? Remember the fleece? Let it be dry, the ground wet, ground wet, it dry. The next time he wasn't satisfied. God even had to send him down to the camp so he could hear a fellow's dream, remember? How that, you know, he had been successful. He doesn't want the job. He's given the job. He's not given enough men to do it. Remember, they start out at 22,000. God says, that's too many. Send them home. So he sent a bunch of them home. He still got 10,000, and he says, that's way too many. And he takes them down to the water, and they have the lap dog. Uh, do you lick the water, or do you bend down and drink it? Test. I don't even know how I would have done on that. I, I've always had a canteen or something to get it in. But so they do that. Well, it's down to 300 of them. So, I mean, this is just a job he does not want. And he does it. And God is the one that said, send them home. You got too many. Here's 300. And so the men of Ephraim, notice in, in Judges chapter 8, the men of Ephraim said to him, what is this thing you've done to us? Not calling us when you went to fight against the Median. That's pretty easy to say now. Why? Because the Medians have turned tail and run. They're getting it handed to them. They don't want nothing of this. But why is Ephraim mad? Because when an army leaves uh, in a hurry, they leave all their stuff. And so there's great spoil. And that's what they're upset about. They didn't get their booty, their money. And so they contended him vigorously. You can imagine how Gideon is feeling at this point. Uh, he's finally, you know, it actually worked out. They left, and so he's chasing them. But he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizar? God hath given the leaders of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb into your hands, and what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. Uh, he handled that very well, didn't he? A soft answer turneth away wrath. I, you know, in the heat of it, I guess he, he also probably remembered he only had 300 guys, right? <laughs> There's a bunch of them, too. But uh, he took that situation that could have easily boiled over into a conflict and made it, uh, made it not so. Appreciate uh, Gideon and him doing that. Reminds me of David. Do you remember David one time when he does the same thing with Saul? He says, what are you worried about? Remember he calls, uh, calls himself a flea. He says, a flea, you know, on you. I I'm nothing. Why would you, you know, even chase after me? There's another case where a soft answer turneth away wrath. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes your anger gets caught up with you. Maybe you've been falsely accused. Maybe someone said something about you. And you're in the heat of the moment. The easiest thing to do is just let that thing fly, right? Just let her rip, tater chip. You know, uh, let that tongue do, do its damage and get deep and go as hard as you can. And let them know a thing or two about, well, that's not the best thing to do. Most of the time, that's not going to win you any friends, is it? Notice Psalms 39, 1 there. It says, take, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. Now, if you look at the context of that entire chapter, he's talking about when he's around his enemies. He's going to be, he, he kind of goes through that chapter and uh, kind of is upset with the fact that it seems like the wicked are prospering and so forth. But in that chapter, he's, he's, um, you know, that context, he's talking about, you know, I won't sin with my tongue. Boy, if, if we could do that. You know, uh, if I could not sin with my tongue, it would be a great thing, as we'll see in James in a little while. Look at uh, Psalms 39, 1. I will guard my ways, the NASB says, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. Wouldn't that be a, you know, that might not be a bad thing sometimes to carry you some duct tape. And you go into a meeting and somebody starts getting after you, just slap a big old piece across your mouth there. Uh, maybe that would, would help me out. Notice uh, the words that we put on the sign out here for this week. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Almost looks like a contradiction, except Jesus is saying, you know, if your words are wholesome and good, you're in good shape, right? You're going to be justified. But if your words are not what they ought to be, you can be condemned. You can be condemned because of your speech, because of your words. And so we need to be careful with our words. Our speech must not, must not include swearing. Now this type of swearing, we're not talking about cussing. 
But we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> and you know, it's not as popular now as it was. But I remember growing up, uh, everybody wanted to swear to God, you know. I swear to God that wasn't me. You know, they'd throw that out there. I don't hear that a whole lot anymore. I guess there's not enough people believing God anymore to think that would even matter. But uh, I don't hear it like, I, well, that's not what we're talking about with swearing here. With the swearing that we're talking about here, we're talking about appealing to a sacred thing as a witness, which is exactly how that's used. You know, oh, I swear to God, I would never do that. Well, not only are you telling somebody you'd never do that, but you're appealing to God as a witness, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, that, that's, that's not a good thing, uh, especially if you're lying. Notice James 5, verse 12 says, Above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Now, if you notice, we had Matthew chapter 5 up there as well. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5, talking about taking oaths, swearing. Uh, you're familiar with this passage. It's the uh, Sermon on the Mount, of course. And in Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible tonight because it's the one that I had out here with me. Um, so in my pages, it's new. So the pages are trying to see together on me. But notice beginning in verse uh, 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Boy, that is very different from the King James, isn't it? But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of the feet, footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. Now, people look at that and say, well, that means you can't take an oath uh, when you go to court. You know, because what are you doing? You've got to put your uh, you hand on the Bible, you know, and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, something like that, Solomon swears. And so you're supposed to be taking an oath. Is that what he's talking about here? No, and we've went over this, if you remember back years ago when we did our study on Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about extremes. The Jews, like the, what I said a while ago, somebody thought, oh, I swear to God, that wasn't me. You know, use that term, and people will use that in everything. From, uh, that wasn't me that got your french fries, you know. <laughs> I didn't drink your Coke, it was in the fridge. And then they'd swear by the God of heaven. And so that's what he's saying. The Jews had, had developed this, where they were just swearing by the, the temple, the gold of the temple. They were just... They just throw it out there. And what he's doing is he's attacking an extreme. And he says, don't swear at all. But is he saying that you can't take an oath in court? Is that what he's saying? No. Just like later on, he says, if your right hand offends you, what? Cut it off. Now, you have a whole lot of people say you can't swear in court, but you will notice they still have both their hands. You just want to say, have you ever sinned with your hands? And they'd be like, well, yeah. Well, then you don't take that literally. Why would you take chapter 5, verse 33, literally? What he's talking about there, because if you remember, Jesus kind of gets sworn in by the high priest. Remember? When Christ won't answer him anything at all, what does the high priest say? I adjure you by the Most High God. What's he do? Basically, he's swearing him in. He's saying, I'm commanding you by the word of God. Tell me whether you're, you know, the Son of God or not. And what does he say? You remember? I am. I am. If you're familiar with the book of Exodus, that takes on a whole different meaning, doesn't it? So that's what's being spoken of there. So don't think that you can't go into a court of law because what they're doing there, they're wanting you to understand how important it is that you tell the truth, that this is legally binding, and you are taking an oath that what you're saying is true and is not what's taking place here with Jesus when they were say, taking an oath about uh, whether it was going to rain tomorrow or not. With that being done, notice, so no swearing. Also obscenity. Now, folks, this ought to go without saying. But we are, uh, Jada, folks your age, high school, Jada woke up. She's like, I got her attention now. Uh, you know, you hear it every day, right? School, uh, if you own a radio, a TV, uh, people cuss at you. And they might not even be talking to you. And uh, there was a guy the other day on Facebook. I, I don't usually do this, uh, but he just said some things that were just ugly. And so... I know, pretty immature of me, but I said, uh, you know, you make some valid points, but why do you have such a trashy mouth? I said, you're a potty mouth, and I kept waiting for him to respond because I wanted him to do it because I wanted to ask him, 
what would his mama would think about what he said. He never did respond. I think I actually hit a nerve with him. I think he uh, left alone. Because some people, if they've got any kind of raising at all, and they're sitting there on a public platform just cussing like a dog. Dogs don't cuss. Why would I blame them? You know what I'm saying. You know, being real vulgar, uh, you know, so I just called his hand on. I said, that's just, you know, why you do that? Smutty language, too. Sexual innuendos. Uh, stuff that's just not befitting. Uh, as Christians, we have to watch what we say. Ephesians 4, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. The use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the ears. Sometimes people need to hear something that may not be edifying. Uh, they may need to hear that what they're doing is wrong or something. And you're trying very hard to help them. Uh, that's good. And so don't think because you're telling them something that's not all that great, your end game is good. You're trying to do good. You're trying to help them see a problem. Sometimes we have to weigh is what I'm saying going to be edifying or, you know, are they not going to pay any attention whatsoever so that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Sometimes, you know, God said to repro reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two of those three are negative, and he's telling, you know, that we have to do that. Uh, Matthew 12, 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? Why? For the abundance of the heart see, that's, that's where our thoughts are. That's what we're thinking. That's what we say. You just don't, have you ever been just sitting around and your mouth just started talking without you? <laughs> just doesn't happen. All those Stephanie swearing up and down, I'm doing all kind of preaching and talking in my sleep nowadays. I'm just thankful she can't uh, understand what I'm saying. I'm glad. Uh, I don't have no idea. Have you ever do that? You ever talk in your sleep? Anybody? Am I the only one that does that? Or Wanda's over there pointing at David. Ed, you'd be talking too? I wish she would tape it sometime. Maybe I could interpret what I was saying. But uh, it might be good sermon material, you know. But, um, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth doesn't speak without your mind being engaged. Now, a lot of times we say make sure your mind's engaged before you start speaking. I think what we mean by that is make sure you got your thoughts in order, you know, and they're good thoughts and they're what needs to be said. Don't just say everything that's on your mind. What does Proverbs 29 tell us? A fool does what? It says everything that's on his mind. A fool beareth all his heart. I just love that Geico commercial where Mrs. Lincoln asked Abe about that dress. You remember that? Does this dress make me look fat? And he's, you, can, you know, honest Abe, right? And he's all torn with it. And finally he turns and does the little bit thing. You know, of course, you know, he's gotten the doghouse over that. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We um, need to be careful what we say. Also cursing to pronounce damnation on someone. Let's take a look at James chapter 3. Because if you had to go to any place in the Bible and just say, okay, this is probably the single greatest teaching about the tongue and controlling it. There's some good uh, sermon material and, and teaching in Proverbs, but nothing is quite as extensive as what you'll find all in one place in James chapter 3. Because James is going to warn us about getting to the point where we think we got it whooped because uh, you, don't, <laughs> you don't whip it, uh, you control it. It's like, uh, you know... Uh, this is not really too far off topic. You know, you can think you've got something trained, and it might surprise you. There's a, I think it's a magician team. Y'all remember those guys in Vegas? They had the white Bengal tigers. Uh, remember? I mean, they're professionals now. They've been doing that show. I can't remember their names. But what? what's that, Sigmund and Freud? Siegfried and Roy? One of the dude's names Roy? Well, you think I'd have remembered that. But anyway, uh, they trained these tigers. Well, do you remember what happened? One of them got agitated, and he stuck his head in his mouth, and what happened? It bit him. Surprise, right? Uh, sometimes when you think that you've got something controlled, that you've got it tamed, and that's what James is going to say about the tongue. We can go ahead and start in verse 1. I, I would like to do that, even though I uh, have verses uh, 8 through 10, but the whole section there, let not, let not many of you become teachers. I know the King James says masters there. What it's talking about is people who teach because you're going to be held accountable. You're going to be held to a stricter judgment. So when you teach, make sure what you're saying is the word of God. Uh, it says talk about stumbling and so forth. Uh, but he, he talks about uh, we, how we put a bit 
in a horse's mouth. And you can make that big, strong animal go whichever way you'd like for him to because that bit's uncomfortable. And so you pull it a certain way, he's going to take off that way, so you'll leave the pressure. Uh, he talks about a rudder, of, uh, you know, on a ship, how such a huge ship is turned by such a, a small thing. And so the, he's warning us that the tongue is uh, like a spark, you know. A little spark's all it takes, and woof, you know, if the, if the temperature and all that is ready, it, it's a fire, verse 6. A, a world of iniquity, a tongue is set among our members that can defile the whole body. Talking about those angry words we sang about a while ago. Uh, notice verse 8, but no one, yeah, I think the King James says no man, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. See, you, you'll never have it mastered to where you can say, I don't even have to worry about my tongue anymore. I'm, it doesn't do that. Well, it can. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who would have made, or who are made in the likeness of God. The same mouth come both blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be done. A fountain, does it send forth both fresh and bitter water? And of course, we know the answer there is no. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. So our speech needs to be consistent with what we claim to be in this life. You see, as a Christian, boy, there's so many things I've got to worry about. I wouldn't say worry about, but think about. You know, my behavior, uh, how I... You know, brethren, we say a lot with our bodies, don't we? With our actions, roll your eyes, you know, curl your nose up when you think something stinks, things of that nature. We say a lot sometimes without ever verbalizing it. So not only do we need to control our tongues, but, you know, even the, even the uh, things that uh, our body lang language. And 1 Peter 3 at verse 10 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and let his lips, if they speak, no guile. Difficult passages to, uh, to live up to because sometimes we're not careful. We're not even think about things sometimes. We'll just say what comes to mind. Also backbiting. To speak against someone who is absent. To gossip. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Let's turn there and I'm going to get a pew Bible because there's no telling what <clears throat> how that will read in the uh, NASB don't get me wrong, it would read correct, but sometimes the verbiage can be so different. And that's one of the things, you know, like an eldership, brethren, has the, I think, the authority to determine what translation a congregation will use publicly. Now, they can't stand and take names, you know, and oh, confiscate your Bible when you walk in the door. But they can say, you know, we would like to stay with the King James, the ASV, or, you know, different translations because we just, you know, especially in a public platform, you can have translations that read so differently than the King James or whatever most folks have in the congregation. That doesn't even make sense sometimes. You can't, you know, keep your place. So uh, uh, that's why I like to try to stay with the King James, even though I have absolute confidence in the New American Standard as well as the American Standard, as well as the ESV. There's good translations out there. But I like to try to read from one that, uh, you know, has this, what everybody else is reading. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning with verse 16. These things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Uh, it's just a figure of speech. There's seven things, but they use that six and for seven. Same thing in the book, book of Joel chapter 1 when they talk about two or for three. A proud look, notice a lying tongue. Uh, so there's one. Uh, it says a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness. How do you do that? Do that with your tongue, don't you? So uh, a lying tongue, one that's a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that what? So a discord among brethren. Isn't it amazing six or seven of those things that God has listed? There's the seven things God says he hates. Three of them involve our tongue. So... Uh, definitely something that I need to uh, be uh, aware of. I don't think I have that. I don't. Let's turn it over to uh, Psalms chapter 15. Psalms chapter 15. I'm trying these days not to put uh, so much, so many slides in when particularly you're going to have several verses in one place. Psalms 15 beginning at verse 1 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? In other words, who's going to live with you? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? Who's going to be with you, God? 
Verse 2, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Verse 3, he that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach or an accusation, you will, against his neighbor. So many of those. Look at how many things involve what we say and how we use our tongue. But our speech should, notice, number one, it should exhort. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. <clears throat> Hebrews, chapter 3, talking about lifting up with our tongues. Notice verse 12, beginning, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Verse 13, But exhort one another, while it is called today, Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast and to the end. So notice verse 13, exhort one another daily while it is called today. With that in mind, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 while you're right there. Most of us are very familiar with verse 25, not forsaking the assembly, and that's a good verse and rightfully so. But notice in verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. You know that being exhorted there in chapter 3? The same idea. That's how we encourage each other, isn't it? I can come up, I can shake your hand, pat you on the back. Uh, that's a good thing. But the exhortation as far as trying to lift you up is probably done a lot more with, with words, words of encouragement. And notice uh, to commend. We ought to use our speech to commend, which is what uh, Paul does of his sister Phoebe. It says, I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Cancrea, or Sincrea. Uh, we can use our speech to honor. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, you may not like the king. <laughs> you may not like all men. The Bible says we need to be respectful of men, because why? Men are created in the image of God. I read something the other day, brothers, sisters, that uh, I thought was very troubling. Uh, and I'm uh, the fact, factual, I, th I don't even know how they keep up. First of all, how do you count all the abortions? You ever thought about that? Somebody says there's so many millions. Yeah, well, me either. But, I mean, who keeps running? Do you have to report that or something? I don't, I don't know. But um, one, something that kind of startled me. I don't get me. I, abortion's wrong. Okay. Remember the, and that's one of the things I want to talk about this morning was, you know how that started out? Remember if a woman gets raped or something like that? You know, somebody's going to die with the abortion. But what is it now? You, you have the child, and you're like, oh, boy, it's an ugly baby, you know? I mean, I, I, that's almost where we are. So you can see how once, time, once something opens up, man, the, the floodgates kind of come through. But the thing that really hit me about this whole abortion thing was over 50% of the black people in the United States, now listen to what I'm saying, over 50% of the black people in the United States are never born. Can you believe that? Over half? And uh, because it's so uh, prevalent. And uh, I'm not sure the figures on that. that, that's what I read, I probably should have looked up the numbers, but I know we have a lot of, I'm amazed when I see the figures that somebody that they Proposes this is how many people are being uh, babies that are being killed, and the reason I bring that up because we're to honor who? All well here honor all men. Who's that? People. People are important. People are created in the image of God. You know, uh, brethren, it, things have swung so much. It seems to me now that you know people are being arrested for animal cruelty. You know. Uh, you know, I remember back when people used to let dogs out all the time. But, you know, nowadays they catch you, they can charge you and put you in jail for letting a dog out somewhere. Uh, I'm not saying you ought to go let your dog out somewhere. But what I am saying is that seems a lot, far less to cry of hurting a child, you know. Well, honor all men. And, and babies are, are people and older people are people. And, uh, you know, we, we need to love people and, and honor men. Some men aren't very honorable. And it's very hard. But God says, because they're created in my image, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That's a tough thing sometimes. You're not happy with the king. 
You're not happy with who's in power. You're not happy with the state legislator or the federal legislator. But what does the Bible say? Pray for who? Pray for the king. Pray for those that are in charge uh, that we may live peaceably. Peter, excuse me, Paul says that's a good thing. Here Peter tells the same thing. Uh, not only to honor men, to use our speech, but also to edify. Notice with me, if you will, uh, I'll leave that on there just for a second. Just for a second. I'll tell you what, we'll go back to it. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. I know I've told you this a hundred times. I guess I'll tell you a hundred more before I die, maybe. But Brother Warren, you know, that was his, of all the things, that brother, I remember so much, he was so concerned about peace. I think after you've lived long enough, and you've seen enough fighting, and you've seen enough arguing, a lot of times over things that just don't amount to much, that you probably just get sick of it. You know, you just get tired of it. And you're, you just, we, peace, your congregation can't grow, it can't edify itself, it can't be what it needs to be if it's all tore up all the time. So let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. We'll go back to our chart here. Uh, just so in case you missed any of those words, you can fill yours out. Uh, I love these old chart sermons, and uh, I like to take and make PowerPoints out of them. It keeps you online, if you, and, but it's very easy. This is what we should do, and this is what uh, we shouldn't do. And cursing and swearing and obscenity and backbiting, these things need to be as far away from us as possible. And the reason that I focused on you younger people, that what you hear and stuff in school, is if, uh, if you're not careful that can become part of your repertoire. In other words, speech that not only do you not pay any attention to, but you may find yourself using. And once you start talking like that, let me tell you something, it's hard to stop. And if you can stop talking like that, sometimes you can't stop thinking like that. Uh, having been in the service and the army and around a bunch of guys my whole life, uh, you know, um, you know, I would like to say that uh, I have my thoughts mastered, but sometimes, you know, old habits. And so it's something that you constantly battle. Why do I tell you that? Because I battle with it. If you, being younger, can just stay away from it and keep that out, it's just another thing you ain't going to have to deal with down the road. You know, a lot of children have come to me and young men, women over the years, especially out at Bible camp. For some reason, that just comes up all the time. They'll come to me personally and they'll say, look, I'm thinking about joining this service or that service. You know, what is your opinion on that? They do that with me and David, I guess, because David B. Smith, uh, the other preacher there. That, uh, well, anyway, and I just tell them, one of the things you're going to have to deal with is, uh, is the vulgarity. Same thing, law enforcement, uh, all those, those kind of uh, love our policemen to death, but, uh, you know, they're and they see a lot and they hear a lot, and so that's where we are. For a Christian, we want to try to stay away as far from that as we can, I realize that some of our jobs were forced into that situation where we have to hear that, but you don't have to participate. And if it's somebody you work with on a daily basis, at some point in time, you might say, you know what, I, I'd appreciate it if you just wouldn't say that. You know? uh, you'd know, you be surprised how many people will appreciate what you have to say. Well, as we talked about this morning, salvation is in the Christ. How do we know that? Because we hear. And that's one of the greatest things, the greatest thing you will do with your tongue is to tell somebody else the gospel. Tell somebody else about Jesus Christ, thereby they can believe and develop faith because they heard you. That's a great thing to do with our tongue. We can repent, confess Jesus' name, something else you need to do with your tongue, be baptized. Lord will add us to the church, and then we've got to be faithful. If you're here this evening, we can help you in any way. We encourage you to do this very thing.